Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be talking about PCs and the unexpected place you might be able to find an old PC. Let's get right to it. While I was at work, I was recycling some boxes, some stuff I had shipped, and I saw this little beige box sitting in the e-waste container with stuff that was ready to be scrapped. Normally you might see something like this and just pass it over because it's probably just some kind of industrial or office thing that doesn't really do anything interesting and whatever, you know, would just go to e-waste with the rest of the stuff in the bin. But I took a little bit of a look and I saw something interesting. On the top of the box, there's something that gives away what this actually is. It says Lucent, which is the brand, and Merlin Mail. And what this is, is a voicemail system for an old Lucent phone system. Lucent was one of the spin-offs of AT&T at some point in the US, and they were pretty popular as phone systems in offices at the time. If you were watching movies or TV shows in the late 80s and into the 90s and probably in the early 2000s, you definitely were seeing these Lucent phones on TV shows. There was often an AT&T logo on the bottom of the handset, which wasn't normally there, but it was placed there as a product placement. So whenever someone in an office environment was talking on the phone, you'd see the Lucent or the AT&T logo there. This thing is a pretty sturdy, solid box on the front here. There's really not much going on, just a little bit of a vent. On the bottom, there's nothing but a label here that just sort of FCC and uh, certification labels. But the back of the machine was what really piqued my interest. Obviously, IEC mains input, power switch, but these here, these certainly look a lot like PC slot covers. If you've ever worked in the telecom industry, a lot of phone systems are very modular and they have cards, at least, well, the older ones. This was before IP phones were common. These are just servers now that run software. But in the old days, there were these digital cards and they were stuck in the phone systems. You could install and do whatever you needed. This thing obviously follows that methodology with these cards, but the size of the old telecom cards was normally a lot larger than these here. But the fact that these are the perfect size to be ISA cards really gives away that this might well just be a PC inside of this thing. Let's start at the top and take a look at what we see in here. So these here are probably some kind of analog or digital telephone interface cards. It says ports one through six, and there are two of these installed. Typically the way these voicemail systems works is they would have these analog trunk lines, potentially up to six on this one, that fed into the phone system. And when a call needed to go to voicemail, it would route the call to these uh, ports here, and this thing would pick up and you know play the message and whatnot. It would uh, have a communication channel, probably some touch tones, where it could signal the voicemail system to show what extension was being dialed. Or of course, someone might be calling in, and they would also be hooked up to one of these trunk lines. This is, And of course, if a user wanted to check their own mail, they probably press a certain number sequence or a button on their phone, and they would get connected to one of these, and then it would prompt them to enter their uh, voicemail box, their password, this, that, and the other thing. Moving down, we see these three ports, and over here it says COM1 and COM2. Well, these are serial ports, and then a blank here that is this port, which looks to be a parallel port, if I was gonna guess. Moving down, we have data manufacturer of seven of 2000. So this thing is almost 20 years old at this point. Telecom equipment has a very long life cycle. So even though this was made in 2000, this easily could have been sold for five, six, seven, eight, nine years before this thing was actually bought. I don't really know how current this was, but telecom stuff just lasts a long time and they don't change very frequently. At least this older digital analog hybrid telecom systems. And at the bottom here, here's the Merlin Mail Release 3. This is obviously something to do with software. It's multi-voltage. does say here Merlin Mail MM04 refurbished. And then we have two stickers here, probably serial numbers or something like that. I'm imagining the 04 and the model number here probably has to do with the four ports this was on that this has. If this had six ports, it would be the MM06. Otherwise, there's not a lot on here to give away that this might be a PC inside, especially because typically you might have IO ports here, like the ATX or the AT connector. Nothing is visible there. And of course, on the front, there's no floppy drive or anything way to boot this thing up if, say, you need to recover it. So the obvious next step is let's just crack the cover and take a look what's inside. 
All right, this thing probably comes off somehow. Oh, seems to slide a little bit. And we lift it right off. All right, so clearly, uh, yeah, this is just a normal PC. You can see the ISA slots down there. And it's a little bit of a mess. And in fact, look at this. The power switch or, the, yep, the power switch has been disconnected at some point. So let's start at the cards. This, uh, these two things look the same, and this is obviously that trunk line card. So this is how the phone system interfaces to the voicemail system to send calls to and from it. There is a little logo here, Brook Trout Technology, with a serial number sticker. 1990, see 1994, Brook Trout Technology, and it says Com Code Series 4, Issue 4. Issue four, that sounds very much like this is something out of the UK. This large IC says 1994 on it again, Rev A. I'd imagine that these two ICs right here are the EE palms, which I can pull out and I can read those on my Mini Pro. I have a little adapter for that, but that might be good to salvage actually, because it's not likely that I can actually use this card. These are 16-bit cards, but there's just a couple actual traces on the 16-bit connector, so it's probably more for stability. This was installed right there into an 8-bit slot. So this card looks very similar, but not quite the same. Look here, it says issue or series three issue four. Now, one thing I noticed that's different is uh, there's actually a TI DSP chip on this one, which this other card seems to be missing. Not sure what the difference is there. They both say 1994 on them, Burke Trout technology, all very similar there. If you have any knowledge about these cards and maybe if there's any kind of use for them, let me know in the comment section below. I did some Googling and I really found absolutely nothing on them. All I could find was some vague FCC references to the company and this uh, COM code issue four. These people seem to make a lot of fax modems and stuff like that, but uh, clearly maybe this is somewhat bespoke for the telecom industry. All right, next up we have what looks like a multi IO card. A Gold Star Prime A. Pretty common IDE ISA card. There's a date code here of 1994 on this chip. So, so even though the computer was built in 2000, supposedly, it seems like all these components are probably from that mid-90s time period. Here on this card, we have an IDE hard drive. Let me take out these four screws, get this out of the case. It's a Fujitsu hard drive from 2000, so this seems a bit later than the rest. On the side here it says Merlin Mail and then Fujitsu 6.2 gigs, so, so I take it these were installed by AT&T, or sorry, Lucent. It's pretty funny that this is just a standard PC power supply, so it's got all the hard drive and floppy drive connectors, and they didn't even cut them off. You would have thought they would have at least maybe zip tied them together or just snipped off the cables that weren't to be used. I mean, it's not like this thing was ever gonna be upgraded or anything, there's no space for anything else. Well, that's pretty funny. Noticing here that they zip tied a couple of the cables on the power supply cable. So normally there are four wires that go to a power switch and the power connector is plugged in on this side of the power supply. Well, clearly that's not happening. That's the front of the computer where there's nowhere to go. So what they did is they just, they just tied off these and then the power switch, it actually injects the power directly into this blue and brown leads directly off this IEC mains jack. Okay, so we're getting a good look at the motherboard now. I still can't see the CPU. It's probably underneath this power supply. But it's uh, this board has SIMS and it has a Dallas semiconductor clock chip here. This Dallas chip is actually a really good thing because this thing is probably dead by now and it's actually in a socket, which is even better, because you can modify these to replace the battery, which is integral to this. But the good thing is, is typically there would be a clock battery over here and it would have leaked and completely destroyed this motherboard by now. Okay, to get this thing out of the case, looks like I have to take these screws off the bottom of this case and that'll probably lift it out. There are two screws here, but the rest of the mounting screws are under this gap right here between the power supply and this plate and I can't, can't get to those from the front. so. I'm going to pop this out. All right, no, actually, it looks like I got to take these nuts off, and I have no idea if this is the right size nut driver, and of course it's not. All right, the power supply has come out. Ooh, it's a little bit dirty inside the case. Nothing much special about this power supply. It does have the sticker on it, so this was probably an official part. 
but this just looks like a very run-of-the-mill PC power supply 200 watt Sensetron fancy Look at the back just bog standard AT power supply There is a voltage switch and there's actually a little bit of a cutout on the case So you could access that voltage switch the fan is still turning in there as I turn this power supply a little bit and I guess with the way the power supply was mounted, it was blowing air out of this vent here, out the front of the case. But this thing obviously had its entire life in an office environment, which is why, you know, all things considered, as old as it is, it isn't that dusty. All right, here's the motherboard. Very interesting. It's a 3D6SX. It's an AMD part, and it's actually labeled 3D6SX40, so it's a 40 megahertz part. I'm finding this little assembly interesting. It's a capacitor, diode, resistor, and a little transistor. And I have no idea what this is. I've never seen that on a PC motherboard. Maybe it's a little oscillator, something like that. I find this motherboard funny. It's got SIM slots, as I mentioned before. But look at this area here. I, I assume this is either for some kind of DRAM or perhaps cache memory. All right, I'm going to yank this out of this case. All right, so these are all the parts that I took out of that case. Let's take a look at this motherboard here. So there's a warranty sticker here that is from 1996. So I'm not sure if that's when this motherboard was sold or what, but this motherboard just does appear to be a relatively inexpensive Taiwanese board. The really crappy QC OK sticker, you just that doesn't really instill a lot of quality, does it? Uh, it has a Phoenix BIOS. Uh, there is a sticker there showing that it's original. A VLSI chipset, also 1995 date. So if this thing really was built in 2000. These parts were just sitting around for a long time. But knowing uh, these guys, they probably bought a huge stack of these and just were slowly putting them in these systems as they sold them. That way they were running with exactly the same hardware. As I mentioned before, it's running an AMD 36SX 40 megahertz. I love that it's got a Microsoft Windows logo and it says it's Windows compatible as if you needed to be told. This right here, it looks like this is where a crystal oscillator would go, and it's got this very strange part installed. Should look like one of these here. This is a 66 megahertz one, which is weird because if that's the main clock for the system, they take that and they divide it by two, and that will run this only at 33 megahertz, so not so great. Everything else about this motherboard is quite unremarkable. Uh, really nothing to report. Let's check out the back. Now that's a bodge wire. It's glued down. Oh no, it's just very stiff, but it's in this uh, jacket. That's quite amusing. I wonder what the deal is with that. But otherwise, uh, no markings on the back. Pretty plain. So for testing, I'm going to use this AT power supply that's from my test bench. It's one that I know works, has good voltage rails, no issues. Don't want to just blow this thing out on the first power up. I have a keyboard plugged in to the computer, and here's this IDE card that was connected, but uh, there's no video card, so we're not going to get very far. So I have a Trident VGA card. Let's pop this in. And the monitor's connected, so let's power up the machine. See what happens. Uh, the fan doesn't work very well in this power supply, so it makes a bit of a clicky noise. Oh, we got a blue light on the... Oh, there we go. All right, there we go, Phoenix BIOS. It's uh, the VL82C310-311, that's the chipset, 2D6 and 3D6 SX motherboard. So that's right. Uh, basically, the 3D6 SX is essentially a 286 chip, but with the 32-bit instructions. So it has a 16-bit data bus, and it's pretty much a 286 externally. Kind of amazing they were making chipsets in 1995 that could still run a 286. But 640K has some shadow RAM. I assume it's one meg of RAM, but I don't know. It could be the way this thing counts it up. And uh, didn't say the battery is dead, so that's quite amazing. I don't know how long this thing was in use for, but it's quite possible that this was replaced at some point. Because if this thing was in production, actually working as a voicemail system, clearly you need a functional clock, clock battery. So maybe they had a service call and someone switched this out. None of the numbers on here really look like date codes to me. None of them make sense that way, so I, I can't tell if this thing has been replaced. All right, well, let's hit Control Delete and go um, into the BIOS. There's that VGA card. It has a mega RAM on it as well. That's as much as the whole system does. Pushing Delete. Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. 
I'm wondering if this is some kind of custom BIOS. Uh, Caps Lock and Num Lock are responding and Control Delete did reboot it. I went ahead and connected the speaker and interesting is it's beeping right now. Let's hit Control Delete. That's a that's a very weird behavior, but that could be custom BIOS on this thing that perhaps, so F1, F2, delete, it's beeping at me. I'm wondering if maybe the hard drive goes bad on this system, it would just beep that way to tell you to call service basically. So yeah, nothing. Every key I push just beeps. There goes that beeping again. Interesting. All right, I'm powering this thing off. All right, I did a little Google and the very first result there says control alt S for setup. Could that be right? It says press escape for memory tests. That's something. Okay, that didn't work. Here's another one that says is control alt insert. Oh, here comes this damn beeping again. Okay, I'm gonna plug in the speaker because that's ridiculous. So, oops, I accidentally hit control alt delete. Hmm, okay. All right, everything I tried, I couldn't get into the setup, so I have a floppy drive connected. Let's power the machine on, see if it seeks. It may not even be configured to boot off of it. I have a DOS floppy disk here. Nice, it did the seek. Oh, it's booting. Nice. Hmm, I booted for a minute and then the floppy drive stopped. Could be that my DOS disk is bad. Let's try that again. So what happens, it boots a little bit, then it pauses. I think it's looking for the hard drive, which of course isn't there. So it's just gonna sit here for a second. It should resume booting. All right, it's booting. Uh, sounds like the disc is bad. It's kind of retrying on the read. Let me find a different disc. Okay, let's put in this AOL boot disc. Same exact problem. It just sort of had an issue after booting after a minute. Yeah, I wonder if this is configured for a 1.2 meg drive perhaps instead of this high, uh, high density three and a half inch. That could be the problem. So it's a few days later and I'm really struggling with this motherboard. I just can't get into the BIOS setup. So I had the bright idea of looking up this main VLSA part here on the internet seeing if I could find other BIOS images for it. And I was actually successful. I found three other BIOS images. They're 64K each for this particular chipset. And I flashed them onto these three chips. These are all AMI, unlike this is, which is a Phoenix Quadtel. But unfortunately, while these boot the computer, they turn on accounts RAM and it just seems to work. These all report keyboard error. Back here on the motherboard, there's a large 40 pin IC. This is the keyboard BIOS chip. And it seems like this motherboard is just wired up a strange way over in the keyboard section. With these in the computer, it turns on, counts up, but anytime I push any keys on the keyboard, it just makes beeping sounds and there's no actual control of the computer. I can't reboot it. I can't go to the BIOS setup. I can't do anything. So I thought maybe the uh, microcontroller here, this is what this is. It's an Intel 8042, was somehow bad. So I went into my spare parts and I dug out my extra keyboard controllers. These three ICs here are them. And all three of these do exactly the same thing. When I swap out the original one, I just get that keyboard error. But with the original BIOS in here, the keyboard is working and it works with the original chip and these three. So there must be something with the way this is wired up that's just slightly different. And this BIOS can talks to the keyboard using different IO pins or something. I'm not totally familiar with how the keyboard stuff works, but I thought it was all pretty standard from one motherboard to another. I didn't really realize that there are some differences, but apparently these three AMI BIOSes, they work differently. So none of these are compatible with this machine, unfortunately. I even went so far as to take out this Dallas clock chip, which stores all the settings on the machine. And I installed a spare one I had. This one has a bad battery in it, but it would result in a, you know, check some error when the computer would boot up thinking that maybe that would allow me to get to the BIOS setup and configure some options. But unfortunately, that didn't help at all. This uh, does show different errors, you know, when it turns on, but it doesn't go into BIOS. It doesn't offer me an option to go into BIOS and just sits there and beep. Next, we have the Mini Pro here. What I did is I copied the original BIOS into the Windows 10 computer here just so I could take a look at the BIOS file, plus save it just in case I screw it up or something. And notice right here, it says, Press F1 to resume, F2 to setup. So clearly something is different on this BIOS, the way it's configured to disable the ability to go in the BIOS. This has a system BIOS on it. Like there's, you know, if I scroll down, there are more strings to do with a setup, but this just seems totally inaccessible. 
I'm thinking now that this is a special custom BIOS that's designed for these motherboards that went into these voicemail systems, probably that have no problem booting up when no keyboard or video card is installed in the machine. Because a lot of times a standard BIOS will give an error and you have to push F1 to continue. Clearly that's not the case. Plus that regular beeping that it's doing really seems like a warning signal to someone who maybe has a voicemail system and say the CMOS battery dies or the hard drive dies, it'll just sit there and go beep, 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 so they know they need to call service on it. So this is some kind of custom chip. There we go, back to the same problem where I can't swap out the diff the BIOS with a more standard one where the keyboard would work. So I have one more thing to try now. All right, so I'm booting off a floppy disk here. And what I did is I found a Phoenix slash Quadtel BIOS setup program on the internet. Now it's designed for a 286, but what I've done is I stuck that on this floppy disk and let's see together, and I haven't tried this yet, setup.com, if this is able to control any of the settings for this particular BIOS. Ah, look at that, okay. So as I theorized, it's set for 5.25 inch, 1.2 megabytes, probably explains why this couldn't boot high density disks. So how do I change this? So 1.4, hard disk type, ah, okay, 203 megabytes. Now, when I was able to boot this computer off this 720K DOS 622 disk, like it is right now, when the hard drive is connected, all I would see was around 200 megabytes or so. And it looked like the majority of the voicemail system wasn't visible, but I think there's some kind of disk manager .sys file that loads when you boot that probably allows it to address the rest of the hard drive because it is a two gig drive. Let's set this to keyboard installed and VGA, EGA. I can't seem to change any of these other things. I'm just gonna disable the hard drive right now. Let me just grab a quick photograph. There we go, not installed, just so it stops giving me that error at boot. Press F10 to exit. All right, let's hit control, delete. Switch back to the high density disk. No, right away it goes back to fix disk controller failure. And the same error here. I'm really just starting to feel that this BIOS is somehow hard coded for those exact settings. Like in the BIOS there's some way to pre-configure it just that way it overrides it every single time. And, and that's gotta be what's happening. Let me boot back to this uh, setup disk again. We'll just take a quick look if it reverted. Yep, reverted right back. How rude, even the clock erased, got erased. All right, so more time has passed and I've looked at how this 8042 microcontroller interfaces to the keyboard on PCs. Now on all PCs that use the 8042, there are four pins that interface to the keyboard connector. There are two input pins here and here, and then there are two output pins here and here. And on this particular board, it uses something inside this PAL chip here to connect the output pins to the keyboard. Now the two data lines on the keyboard are keyboard clock and keyboard data, but they're bi-directional. So there are both inputs and outputs for the two pins that are on here on this chip. Here's the schematic from the IBM 5150, which I assume pretty much everything is based off of. And the four lines are test one and test zero, and then P27 and P26. And you got keyboard clock and data. Over here on the right is the keyboard connector. You got the clock and the data lines again. And on the 5170, this section right here, there's an LS00, and I think these are two transistors in some type of an IC package. This is used to connect the two data line and the clock lines together. This is what's replaced with the PAL chip on this 36SX motherboard. I have a feeling most of the stock BIOSes are expecting this type of circuitry to connect these lines together. But on this motherboard, this PAL chip is used instead of those circuits, and obviously the original BIOS on this motherboard is doing something to this PAL chip or controlling it in a special way that interfaces these lines to the keyboard connector. And when I try to use these other BIOS chips, it's probably looking for the 5170 standard way of doing it, and therefore you get these keyboard errors. This is my scope probe, and I have scoped out these signals. I see activity on them, but it just doesn't really make sense what's happening. Now on this board, even though I've traced out the way this PAL works, I can't read inside of there to look at what logic is happening and what signals are required to toggle those lines. I do know if I pull this PAL chip from the motherboard, this machine doesn't work at all. So clearly this is used for a little bit more than just this keyboard interface. So I've reached a dead end with this particular motherboard. I can't use it because of that BIOS problem. 
And unless someone has any ideas of how to maybe disassemble this BIOS and we can figure out why it's not letting me enter the BIOS, that might make this thing usable. But until then, this is gonna be relegated to spare parts. If this just sits around, I may end up stealing parts on it, like some of these SIMs or some other ICs that are usable. But yeah, it's too bad I couldn't get this working because it's a pretty nice motherboard and it's nice not to have any battery damage. My only other 36SX motherboard I have, unfortunately had the battery leak all over it and has damaged the board. I've repaired it, but there's a lot of corrosion that are under things and it may fail again at some point in the future. Anyhow, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button. You can subscribe for more videos. There'll be lots more in the future. And I'd love to hear your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.